All right, welcome everybody. I'd like to thank Ellie Bornstein and Sasha Shipanik for uh, the invitation and to uh, my thanks also to the Jordan Center for um, hosting the talk today. This is my first visit to NYU and it's a beautiful day in New York and I'm really honored to be here to speak with you today about, about my book. So uh, as Elliot said, this book was published in 2021 by Cornell University Press. And it, for me, it represents the end of a very long journey. This was a dissertation project and my first book. Um, so for me, it's, an, it's a kind of an end point, but I hope also that the book marks a beginning uh, of sorts, a beginning of what I hope will be new conversations and new pathways for our field to explore the particular way that photography and poetry encounter one another, historically and in the present day. Um, I think this work may even have some bearing on how we encounter and remember the present war in Ukraine. Um, like most of you, I've been watching Russia's cruel and violent war unfold in Ukraine via a stream, steady stream of photographs uh, of, of unimaginable destruction in, in cities and towns um, through this sort of steady stream of social media imagery uh, from which I can't seem to look away. Uh, but I've also had the opportunity to listen to and read the words of poets chronicling this war, um, both in its earlier stage um, via this book here, Words of War, New Poems from Ukraine, um, from Academic Studies Press, um, and also uh, poets in Ukraine writing in real time uh, about what's unfolding around them. Uh, and so if you haven't checked this out, um, lithub.com, there's a typo there, it's lithub, H-U-B, uh, has a, a section devoted to Ukrainian poetry in translation. Um, I also recommend, so poets like Irina Shavalova um, and, uh, also, the, the writer and photographer Yevgeny Belarus, it's up here. Um, there's, there's quite a lot available in translation. These people, poets, um, writing and chronicling the war today. And my experience of this war from this safe and privileged distance reminds me uh, that what has always compelled me to work on this topic uh, is, is really the power of poetry and photography to operate as modes of historical and pers personal witness. Um, this is about the power of photography to make us look and to document and archive the quotidian, the catastrophic, and the apocalyptic. And photography concerns itself too with manipulation and distortion of images and therefore distortion of truth. And, and this is an enormous problem in the narratives of the present war as we see in the aggressive and tragically persuasive disinformation campaigns um, that, are, that are unfolding. This book is also about the power of poetry, of the poetic word to preserve and bear witness to history. Like photography, poetry allows us to capture and convey love and loss, connection and destruction across impossible distances in time and space. And the writers featured in the pages of my book, some of whom were refugees from the violence of the last century, demonstrate through their exploration of photo poetics that poetry can meet and sometimes exceed the compelling force of photographic representation. So with that, I want to turn to just a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll begin with some of the central concepts and the main argument of the book um, and talk a little bit about the title. And then I'm gonna give um, brief case studies of examples from Pasternak and Svitaeva and then a quick we have a teaser about the Brodsky material um, to give you a taste of how uh, photo, photo poetics operates for these writers. Um, and I'll conclude by sharing a, a poem, a photo poetic poem um, from the present war context from a uh, Ukrainian poet, Irina Shuvalova, that I think uh, challenges some of the conclusions that I came to in my, in my book uh, in, in interesting ways. So snapshots of the soul asked broadly, what it is that compels a poet to turn to the photograph, whether as the subject of a work, as material for metaphor, or as the structural framework for a poem. The book rep represents part of a growing body of scholarship that um, investigates the particular way that photography operates as 
uh, material or method for poetic writing in the 20th century. In my work, I draw on theories of lyric and elegy, the social history of technology, and little known materials from the Russian literary archives to consider how encounters with photographs and photography enter the space of poetic writing for a range of Russian language poets in emigre contexts, as well as in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia. So the main chapters of the book offer a deep dive into photography's role in the creative worlds of Boris Pasternak, Marina Tsvetaeva, Joseph Brodsky, and Bella Akhmadulina. Um, and I also consider a selection of works from other modern and contemporary poets uh, in the introduction in the final chapters and in, in the coda to the book. The book uses these case studies to ask how and why poets are drawn to the language, the representational power and metaphorical possibilities that photography offers. And I found in my research that photography's status as a kind of visual threat to the verbal arts compels these writers to harness the poetic word, to confront, engage, and sometimes transcend the compelling force of photographic verisimilitude. Photography ultimately operates as both inspiration and opponent for modernist poets for whom language is the main material of expression in a world increasingly saturated with images. So we have here the sort of Bloomian anxiety of influence problem, right, where the poets are imitating aspects of the photographic, but they also innovate or engage with photographic seeing in ways that are made possible only through poetic writing. Um, I also want to say this work is, um, it, it goes a little bit beyond just a study of ekphrasis. So ekphrasis would be like poems describing photographs. Uh, the book takes as a central question, something that's broader and aims to open scholarship to a deeper investigation of the ontological connections between the lyric and the snapshot. When we think of photography and, and, um, and poetry together in Russian culture, we tend to think of photo montage experiments, right? Um, and a number of scholars, Stephen Hutchings, Yindrik Doman, Alexander Bashkovich, Sergei Ukashin, have done fascinating work on that important topic. Um, certainly studying the cognitive and creative possibilities of placing poetic text alongside photographic image or collage is an important area of critical inquiry. But my research has a, a different focus. So my interests here are what I call the poetics of photography or photo poetics. And by that, I mean those elements of photographic processes and modes of photographic representation that give rise to new forms of lyric expression. When I talk about the poetics of photography, I'm engaging with those aspects of photography that can become the essential creative material of poetry. So this includes, for example, the way that photographic motifs, photochemical metaphors, and the lexicon of photography, words, right, snapshot, flashbulb, um, development, you sort of uh, lexicon of photography, how they are written into poetic texts that are not necessarily inspired by actual photographs and are not necessarily printed on the page alongside an accompanying image. This broader photo poetics deals with the qualities of the photograph that bring about poiesis, right? The creation and production of other imaginative realms. Okay, so what are these qualities, right? What is this photo, photo poetic quality? These can include things like the possibility of instantaneous fragmented images of real world experience. Um, it has to do with often with the complex relationship between the self and the past. Um, there's a tension between motion and stasis that matters for some of these writers, certainly distortions of memory and history. And of course, if we think about Boris and Sontag and a long line of writing about the, the link between photography and the anticipation of death. Um, so many of these themes are present, right, and these aesthetic concerns are present and shared by poets writing before the invention of photography. But the advent of the camera age requires this new attention to and new methods for engaging them. As skillful readers of the photographs, the poets featured in my book transform and create something new from their encounters with this medium. And they push beyond describing or embell embellishing photographs with texts. Instead, they're, they're moved by their various encounters with photography and are challenged to expand the possibilities of poetic expression in new directions. 
And these poets, as we'll see, use the process of poetic writing to deepen, enrich, and enhance what photographic representation makes possible. Um, before we look at a few examples of this poetic, poetic writing, I want to speak a bit about the title of my book, Snapshots of the Soul and Where It Comes From, and how it illustrates this sort of powerful relationship between poetry and, and photography that goes beyond ekphrasis. So this is um, Boris Pasternak's 1916 poem, Anguish Crazed Craze, Asta Byeshenaya Byeshenaya. Um, this poem class closes with a fascinating and troubling imperative. The lyric speaker appeals to um, the glass cutter, Stikolshik, to fit into an open frame a, quote, caustically ingrained photograph of my soul. Within the space of these lines that conclude this obscure futurist poem by one of Russia's most important 20th century poets. This is a poem that he did not uh, anthologize or, or reprint. Um, but it's, it's special because within this, we have an image that condenses into itself many of the problems and opportunities that arise when poetry encounters or takes up the photographic. So the central noun phrase, a photograph of my soul, captures with incredible precision the tensions that arise when written word faces off against this powerfully precise technology for capturing and preserving images taken from life. And when embedded in the lines of a lyric poem, this phrase issues an aggressive challenge to photography. It's a challenge that responds directly to the threat that photography poses to writing. So what could this mean, a photograph of the soul? And, and how does it challenge the limits of the, pos the possible? The soul is the essence of being. It's, but at the same time, it's a fully intangible essence, right? It's this aspect that we is once enduring and transcendental, but in, ephemeral. The soul is invisible. And indeed, it completely defies visualization, right? So how can you get a photograph of the soul? We can't see it. Um, it's something that can never exist in material form. And yet this is precisely, I think, what makes the notion of a photograph of the soul so tantalizing to the poet. Because to use the poetic world to bring the word, poetic word to bring into existence the essence of a person or an experience in legible and sometimes tangible poetic form is to engage in the true project of poetry. As Helen Bendler says, um, a, a poem is the voice of the soul itself. So it's not only Pasternak who uses this phrase, a photograph of the soul. Um, versions of this concept appear in the, the words and works of other poets as well. For example, in this um, 1931 poem, uh, the concluding lines of Marina Tsvetaeva's Dom are Divishiski daguerreotype Bushimaye. So a girlish daguerreotype of my soul. Uh, the formula snapshot of the soul is also found in Joseph Brodsky's assertion in an interview that poems themselves are like photographs of the soul. So he is speaking here about the, the cycle of Christmas nativity poems. I have seven or eight nativity poems. It's sort of a form of discipline, like a man who takes a photo of himself every year in order to see what he looks like. And indeed, Brodsky's parents photographed him sort of on the spot over, over many years. It seems to me that this way you can more or less follow your stylistic development, the growth of the soul in some sense. In other words, these poems are like photographs of the soul. Unfortunately, a huge mass of negatives are lost. By that he means drafts. So this, this idea of a snapshot of the soul is an irreconcilable collision of ideas. It's an impossible product because of its simultaneous demand for and rejection of material artifacts. And yet within this incompatibility of this irreconcilable phrase is precisely what uh, Foucault has called in his meditation on visual and verbal arts, a starting point for speech. Here it is. So Foucault writes, it is not that words are imperfect or that when confronted by the visible, they prove insuperably inadequate. Neither can be reduced to the other's terms. It is in vain that we say what we see and what we see never resides in what we say. But if one wishes to keep the relation of language to vision open, if one wishes to treat their incompatibility as a starting point for speech, instead of as an obstacle to be avoided, so as to stay as close to possible, as possible to both, 
then one must preserve the infinity of the task. To create a photograph of the soul is an impossible or put differently an infinite task. And that I think is precisely why it's so compelling to these, to these poets. Using poetry or photography to ask, uh, access an intangible essence of being is something that I uh, demonstrate in the book's final chapter is frequently figured as happening in the space of unconsciousness or sleep and dreams. The late Soviet photographer Alexei Parshikov warns of the hazards of this realm of altered consciousness. Um, he suggests that photographs are present uh, they present us with, a, with dangerous visions, like the kind that doom Orpheus on his journey from the underworld. Here's this quote from Parshikov's essay. Photography has never been connected to two-dimensional existence or timetables. It has a visionary task, and it more closely resembles the state of sleep and dreams. Perhaps photography is Orpheus's backward glance, and you're better off tearing up the photographs if you don't want to know too much about what lies ahead. Photography's anticipation of what lies ahead indicates the medium strong associations with themes of death and mourning. And this elegiac accent is almost part of a ritualized performance uh, in the use of the photographic trope in poetry. When photography is present as the subject or as an image in a poem, it almost always carries with it the pain of loss of a loved one, the shadow of a future death or a trace of an encounter that is otherwise irretrievable. Now, there are another number of elegant poems uh, about photo poems about death that I cover in the introduction in the main chapters of my book. And I certainly would welcome questions about them in the, in the Q&A. But my plan for today is to show you um, a few of the poems where the poet is doing what I've, what I've just described. They're using the photographic, right, invoking or imitating photographic processes as a way of showing what poetry can do that photography can't. So we'll look at a few of my favorite examples, one from Svitaeva, one from Pasternak, and then I'll show you a little bit of what Brodsky does with this, with this theme in one example. Um, the last portion of the talk I want to, I'm gonna summarize sort of what the conclusion that I come to in the book about what is happening in the present day around photopoetics, but show you an example of a, a contemporary Ukrainian poet who is doing something quite different that I think is important to look at at this, at this time. Okay, so Pasternak is a really great example of a poet with a complicated relationship to photography. He is extremely dismissive of portraits. He has a lot of antipathy toward photographs of himself, which he says usually make him look like a cretin or a gorilla. <laughs> Though often critical of his own photographs, Pasternak does occasionally praise images that he finds to be skillfully rendered. So what are the conditions for a successful uh, photograph in Pasternak's view? One criterion is for, for a successful photograph is that it captures the living dynamic essence of a person, a trace of the body in motion. So how does Pasternak imagine that one could capture the dynamic motion in the form of a static photographic image? Um, in relating to Tsutaeva, the circumstances that led to the creation of this rare flattering portrait in the studio of the well-known Petersburg photographer, Moisil Napelbaum, Pasternak emphasizes the way that a variety of external factors led the photographer to successfully capture his image. And the key he reports is that the picture was successful because it was photographed in all aspects instantaneously. This is what he writes to, to Taiva about this photo. By the way, you once spoke of a photograph. The only time that I turned out well in a photo was because I was photographed in all aspects instantaneously. They were taking pictures of Shenya and our boy in the photographer's studio and everything was set up and ready to go and they invited me to join the picture. I didn't even have a chance to collect myself. It just turned out, that is, I turned out well. I was overheated. It was summer in Petersburg. I had just carried the boy up six flights of stairs and in the attic studio under the skylight window, it was very stuffy. Usually I come out looking like a Cretan or a gorilla, which in actuality, and not only in the slice of an instant, I am. <laughs> so. So there's little in the resulting family portrait to suggest this heated, hurried scene that apparently took place in the moments leading up to the one captured on film. But Pasternak emphasizes the motion and the physicality of the moment, right? The sweltering heat, the exhaustion from climbing the stairs, the suddenness of the invitation to pose with his family. 
And he attributes the success of the image to the spontaneity of his entering the photo frame. Though the still photograph without Pasternak's explanation betrays little of this dynamic backstory, we see in Pasternak's interpretation of the image evidence of the centrality of the interplay of motion and stasis that lies at the heart of this writer's simultaneous attraction to and repulsion from photography's ability to still and preserve moments from life. So it's really all about motion and dynamic states of being when it comes to Pasternak and, and photography. Pasternak's brother, Alexander, who himself was, uh, he was an architect and a, and a pretty active photographer. Um, he recalls in his memoirs, a set of these photographic flip books that their uncle had sent from Vienna. So there were some with horses and soldiers and uh, city, city scenes, this sort of thing. Kind of like the, um, the Moybridge ones that are so famous. Alexander describes how adept Boris was at rhythmically manipulating the books in such a way that the motion was perfectly unbroken. While Alexander himself, the younger brother, struggled to keep the Austrian soldiers from moving in comically jerky fits and starts. So here's the quotation from the memoirs about this. Boris was determined to master the secret of the albums. We used to study individual photographs for hours, particularly amazed by the incredible pictures taken in mid-action. Gradually, we worked out that each photograph differed from the next by some imperceptible detail, and that if you skip several pages, the difference became obvious. In the end, we came to the conclusion that everything in nature acted in the same way as we saw here. There was an uninterrupted chain of infinitesimal moments, movements, a small number of which had been caught by the camera. Boris made this discovery, which had a truly overwhelming effect on us both. So the process of studying the fine anatomical details of the photographic flipbooks revealed to Pasternak photography's ability to capture in precise detail a single slice of a moment. But it's one that within the flow of time, right, is imperceptible to the eye. And at the same time, that dynamic movement of time is documented in an incomplete fashion. The camera can only capture a fragment of time's infinite and uninterrupted chain of motion. Pasternak's book of lyric poems, Sistra Maya Zizan, was conceived in the summer of 1917 and published in 1922 in Moscow. And it's no accident that Marina Tsutaeva uses the word piece in her essay, Sitavoy Lieven, The Downpour of Light, to describe and characterize this early collection. It's the first of Pasternak's work that she read. She writes the following, by the way, on the nature of light in Pasternak's poetry, photography, piece. that's what I'd call it a poet of lightnesses. Others are, for instance, poets of darknesses. Light, eternal courage, light in space, light in movement, slashes of light, explosions of light, veritable banquets of life. It has flooded and overflowed, not just from the sun, but from all that radiates. And for Pasternak, everything gives off rays of light. So Sveta piece, of course, is the original Russian word for photography, right? It's light writing, pisat Svetom, Sveta piece. And while photography is perhaps not precisely what Svetaeva means when she uses the piece to characterize this collection, as an amateur photographer herself, I think she was undoubtedly aware of its extended lexical connotations. And to the extent that the use of the piece is, is applicable here, um, it, it's, it's really an apt characterization for the whole collection. My Sister Life is, uh, includes poems that are built around images of flashbulbs light sensitizing solution and animated photographic portraits. So if you look at the poem Zerkola, Groza, Mamentalna and Naviak, and Zemistitsinitsa, we have photographic imagery working to establish this enduring aesthetic principle for, for Pasternak. And this is one that locates inspiration, emotion, and consciousness at points of tension between the static and dynamic states of being. Using photographic motifs in the poems of My Sister Life is not on the whole done as a means of capturing and collecting images in frames and, and poses. Um, just as Alexander Pasternak's memoir suggests, they're, they're, interested in, they're interested in the sort of natural state of, of being this world in a, that unfolds in an uninterrupted chain of infinitesimal moments, a small number of which can be captured by the camera. So the goal of Pasternak's poetry is to capture the full range of dynamic motion of, uh, in the natural world. And then, so, so when he, if he's trying to capture everything sort of in its dynamic state, he's not interested in these small 
framed and printed encapsulated photos. Instead, his early photopoetics is one that's always in motion. Um, it's paradoxically striving to capture and immortalize experience, but it never wants to go so far as to fix it in, in a static form. So let's look at how this works with uh, this poem, Grazama Mentai Nainaviak, A Storm Instantaneous Forever. Um, the, the first sentence, we have this personification of, of nature and summer um, as a photographer. So, Zatim Prashalas Letas Polustankum, Snavshi Shakus, Tosli Pashik photography, not you snal na pamit crom. Right, so Thunder took as a souvenir of a hundred blinding photographs of the night. This is not about preserving those images. It's about the sort of flash, right? And the, the photographs, uh, it's been pointed out in scholarship, are blinding, right? They're not about showing us, giving us access to seeing. It's about the sort of process of, of um, illumination of, of nature. Um, so invoking the photograph gives us the sense that we're trying to capture something, preserve it, but it's done without stilling the image, right? In this, in this blinding flash of 100 photographs of the night. Um, it continues, we sort of illuminate other aspects of the natural world in the next stanza. So more illumination by the natural world, of the natural world and of the world of people. In the third stanza, we get Pasternak bringing in another art form. He's using charcoal drawings to sort of evoke the this uh, torrential downpour of rain. So we're getting another sort of aesthetic way of capturing the dynamic motion of nature, right? Through the charcoal drawings of this, this gate of rain crashing down. The last sand is super, super interesting because He's taking us now beyond the natural world into the conscious mind. And we get this hyper illumination right, through this photog photographic principle of, of, of the deepest recesses of human consciousness. You can't do that with a camera, right? right? It would reach, it would, right? illumination would reach even those corners of the mind, it seemed, where it is now as light as day, right? this hyper illumination of consciousness through the invocation of this photographic metaphor, right? Nature sort of photographing and digging into the recesses of the human mind. You can't do that with a, with a photograph. So this, it's, a, it's an example of what I've been saying that, that photopoetics is more than just describing photographs. It's using the tools of photography, right? To take us in new directions. We see this, I won't go through the whole poem, but uh, another one from the same collection, Zerkala. And this is the cover image for the book. This is Alexander Pasternak in the, in the front with the camera. But he's his younger brother. He's, he's the one who's the photographer. Behind him is Leonid Osevich, Pasternak, the painter. They're in his studio on the Volkonka Street. And you can see a photograph, uh, not a photograph, sorry, a painting. So we have stages of visual culture, cultural history unfolding, right? From painting to photography. And we have this uh, mirror selfie. And the mirror is special because it's, it's not just a zerkala, but it's the trumo, it's this long rectangular mirror that, that shows up in the poem Zerkala. So these, the photo was taken around the same time that he was writing this collection. So I think he's really thinking about that, that particular uh, you know, piece of furniture <laughs> that he had access to. So in this poem, we have a world sort of in windy chaos outside, and it's being reflected in this trumo, in this, in this long mirror. And the lyric speaker of this poem is like ecstatic about the fact that, that we're seeing this reflection and all of this chaos and all of this almost violence happening in the windy world outside, and it doesn't break the glass, right? There's something special about that reflectiveness. And this is not the beginning, this is sort of a middle stanza. He brings in, he evokes the photographic process here by invoking uh, collodion, which was a, a liquid that's applied to the glass plate surface um, to sensitize the, the plate to light. So it's not the fixing solution in the development process as some scholars have, have confused it with, but it's the stuff that makes it possible for light to interact and keep the image. So in this sentence, we have uh, in this stanza, 
казалось бы, все колоде и залы, с комода до шума в стволах. It's not just covering the mirror. They're covering, it's covering the whole world in this light sensitizing ocean, right? That makes it permissible to like capture the experience of, of the living natural dynamic world outside. And yet it's, you know, it's, it's, it's this ecstatic declaration, right? That it doesn't break the glass. This is the final stanza. Огромный сад тормошит в зале, подносит к тремолку лак, бежит на качели, ловит в зале, трясет и не бьет стекла, right? All, there's almost violent imagery, but it doesn't, it doesn't impact it. It's only a reflection. It's only um, the sort of metaphorical means pulling in the photographic technology to sort of uh, capture this, this ecstasy of, of reflection and, and perpetual, perpetual moment, movement uh, and motion in the world outside. Okay, I wanna turn now to Marina Tsvetaeva's relationship with photography. Tsvetaeva is often assumed to be a poet completely uninterested in the visual world. She often writes of her rejection of the, 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 the world of vision. She even apparently refused to wear glasses because she was nearsighted and she liked to experience the world in sort of a, a foggy haze. <laughs> um, so she has all of this sort of performance of rejecting the visual. But she was a really keen amateur photographer. And in the 20s and 30s, she became really, really interested in taking and printing, right? Developing her own photographs, labeling them, sending them to friends. Uh, she even wrote in a letter around this time, I'm born a photographer. So it's a pretty strong statement. She had her own camera and she purchased this Kodak Brownie camera for her daughter, Ariadna. I only discovered these photos recently that didn't make it into the book, but they're just so gorgeous. I, I wanted to include them in the talk. These are also mirror selfies. I think it's 1929 or 1930. <laughs> so unlike the way that photographic motifs operate in Pasternak's poetry, Svetai was drawn to photographic prints and she envisions them as a kind of third space in which souls can commune across in physical and metaphysical boundaries. Her use of photographs is similar to how she in her poetry uses dream motifs, tombstone imagery, and the idea of the poetic world, word itself. Um, if you think of her poem to Rilke after his death, Novogodnya, right? She creates this third space where they can meet each other in this afterworld. And photographs work the same way for her. So here's some examples. Um, she has an early poem to my grandmother, Babushkia. This is an acrostic poem. She describes this photograph that was in the family home of her maternal grandmother. And she opens as many photo poems do that are acrostic, right? sort of describing the grandmother's face and her hair and the position of her hand, right? The tendrils. But then it, it allows her to begin to ask this question by the end of the poem. Babushka, et jistoki mitjej v serts mayom right? Is this fiery sort of spirit in my heart from you? So accessing the spirit of the dead relative through the photograph. She does it also with Rilke. Um, we know a lot about the correspondence from 1926 between Tsvitaev and Pasternak and Rilke, um, but little attention has, has been given to the photographs that they exchange. So Tsvitaev sends Rilke her passport photo and he says, you know, thank you for the photo. I, I hesitate to send you my passport photo because it's just so haphazard. It's just a random photo, but I'm going to put it on the desk next to yours and we can get acquainted in pictures. <laughs> I'm sure she loved this, right? This idea of communing through the face of the photograph. And then he sent her a series. It's about eight photos of himself in, uh, in Museo in Switzerland. And she sort of reads in these images, like a parting. And some scholars have seen this. Alyssa uh, Gillespie sees this as like, her understanding, at least at a subconscious level, that Roka is dying and that there's this parting. Um, she does it also after she's left Prague. So Prague is her beloved city and she leaves and she writes to her friend Anna Teskova who lives in Prague and says, send me a photograph, a black and white photograph, not a reproduction from a painting. It has to be a black and white photograph of the Prague night. This is a statue that's below the um, Charles Bridge. So there's a bunch of statues on the bridge. And this one is a little bit lower down. And she wrote poems about this night. She saw him as having her own, sharing her facial features 
she thought they looked alike. And so again, she's connecting not just with people she knows or dead relatives, right? But to a, a medieval knight from a different century, like completely different time and place. And she wants to do it in a photographic image. All right, so a poem that is further enriched by understanding Sotaeva's interest in photography is this 1931 lyric, Don. And I quoted this earlier. It's the one that ends with Divichiski daguerreotype bushi my a girlish daguerreotype of my soul. Um, so at this time, this is around the time when Sotaeva's interest in photography reaches its greatest intensity. And it compelled me to go back and look at this photographic metaphor at the end. Um, and, and what I found is, so in general, scholars have remarked that this, there's a, a metamorphosis in this poem of the image of the home, right, dom, into a kind of self-portrait of the soul. Um, but what I think makes this reading even more compelling is if we know what, if we, if we look into what Svetayva knew about certain photographic image objects like the daguerreotype. So the daguerreotype is old photographic technology at this time, right? It's, it's, it's sort of this antique thing, but she, she had them in the family home. They had them in her father's museum. So she knew what it was like. Has anyone here ever um, held a daguerreotype? Yeah, so what's it, what's it like? It's not cold. It's, yeah, it's this, it's this silvered, like polished metal surface. And when you look at a daguerreotype, you're almost always seeing a reflection of your own image. It's like a mirror, right? Oliver Wendell Holmes called it a mirror with a memory. So you've got the, the actual image that's on the daguerreotype, but you're also seeing your own face layered on top of it. And I think that's what happens in this poem. So we can look at, um, so what I argue in this chapter is that this lyric is constructed as if the speaker is looking at a daguerreotype, seeing at once her own facial features reflected in, right, superimposed on an image of an old house. It's a vision of the self within an image from a childhood memory. So here it is, um, the first two stanzas. Ispad nak morenich bravie dom, but the unisi maie, din, but the moledest maia, minya strichai, zdrasvaya. Tak sama chusvina znakom, lob prachushi se pad plashom, plusha, strastayushi se snim. So if, if the daguerreotype is a mirror with a memory, right, and it has this layered quality creating this almost double exposed image of the self and whatever is represented there. Um, in sp the speaker of Sotaeva's poem, right, is, is looking out, right, from under these scowling brows and sees, right, she sees her, her face and the house. Um, and, and it goes on to interweave the image of her forehead under the hood of a raincoat with the ivy that grows on the roof of the house. So we have blush, right, raincoat, merging phonetically with blush, the ivy. And the visual imagery is also layered in the same plane. And later in the poem, the, her forehead becomes the archway of her father's museum, and her eyes are reflected in the thick green glass of the window panes. So invoking this photographic metaphor for layered visions of the self allows for the construction of a powerful image of a present and a former self. And at the same time, by avoiding any sort of direct acrostic writing, the poet asserts the power of the poetic word to substitute for any you know, embodied image uh, uh, in a visual text. So again, this is, I think, a really powerful example of how photopoetics goes beyond a crisis, right? She's doing something here that only poetry can really do, but she's drawing on that photographic technology to, to do it. So another, uh, another feature of, of the Tsvitaeva chapter is a series of photographs that Tsvitaeva took in um, 1934, and they're of the interior of the apartment of Nikolai Gronsky. Gronsky was an aspiring poet, Russian emigre. He was close friends with uh, Tsvitaeva, and he died um, in November 1934, it was like it was like a metro accident to the in the subway. He and some people suspect it might have been a suicide. Maybe it was an accident. But Svetaeva, learning about this, um, did an, she wrote some essays about him as as a poet, and she wrote a cycle of poems Nad Grobia um, around this time. But in the process of composing this poem, she went to the apartment and took this 
series of uh, this interior study uh, of his, the objects that he left behind. And so what the, this chapter shows is the way that these photographs are linked with the imagery of the poem. And so the photographic study of interior study of his apartment is part of her process of poet creation at this time. So just an example here, uh, we have the words of the deceased write his last words before he left. She's in the search throughout the poem for some trace of the deceased, something left behind. And she keeps sort of turning to these objects and coming up empty. Um, and the writing desk, right, is such a key locus for right, poetic creation. This is Gronsky's writing desk. Rilke sent her a photo of his writing desk, right? So it's this, uh, she has a poem, Moi pismini vermisto, right? Um, it's, it's this super important um, part of the poet's creative life. She also uh, is, you know, looks, invokes the image of the icon, which appears in one of the photographs. Uh, in another one, there's this double doored um, cabinet. And she wrote, she sent this photo to Anna Teskova and said, my books were among their, those uh, as well. So right, this, this double doored cabinet open like a cathedral. Um, all the books are in their place. The letters are present, but your face, where has it gone, right? So she moves through these photographs. We have surrogate images. Gronsky's mother was a sculptor and she made these busts of her son that are on the mantle, but it's not him, right? Represented by the bed, right? The warmth. She can't find it. She's not going to have that meeting like she does in Novogonia with Rilke. Um, it's this empty sort of search. But in the poem's conclusion, she comes to the understanding that if you exist anywhere at all, it's within us, it's within the memory of those who read your poems, who remember your work, right? Um, all right. She also has this eerie double exposed image. I remember sitting in the, in the reading room of Ed Galli trying to figure out what this was. And it's a little bit foggy, so I got a magnifying glass from the, the desk and uh, turned it sideways and saw a ghost. <laughs> and it's, it's to die, but she it photographs herself in this image, right? And she's sitting at the desk, probably holding a volume of Gronsky's poetry, right? As if the, to say, this is where you are, right? This is what remains, it's the poetry. And she's placed herself right into this eerie sort of space of liminality and double exposure. So, I just want to turn to Brod Brodsky, just one part of the Brodsky chapter that I think is pretty uh, interesting and you might want to take a look at if you get a chance to in the book. Um, so the chapter on Brodsky is about how this poet debates whether poetry or photography is a better means of capturing and preserving human experience and human memory. He does it in essays, he does it in poetry. There's this tension, right? Is photography better? Is poetry better? Brodsky's father was a photographer. He himself is a photographer. Um, and in his Roman elegies, he has a section that's like his own exegy monumentum poem. It's the building the monument in, in words, right? Like Pushkin, like Horace. And he, and he brings in the idea of photography here as a possible tool for preserving the essence of a life or uh, the, the creative body of, of works. And Brodsky asserts that his present preference here is for the written word, but he brings them both in. So this is the stanza. So, right, I learn about my own future from the, from the letters, from the black ink on the page, but it's the same as how other people, and I love this, falling asleep, right? They fall asleep in an embrace with a Leica camera refracting in the lens dreams so that they can know themselves by the picture having woken, right? Sort of developed in a longer, uh, in a longer life in this sort of future memory space. So at, um, at Yale University in the Beinecke Library, there are, there's a Brodsky's American Archives. And I found the manuscript drafts 
for what he, how he was working out this stanza. And so he had worked out the things around it. And then on the next page of the notebooks, this is where he's gonna figure out how to do the Leica and how to do the camera. And so chapter three goes through and sort of deciphers the manuscript and you can see how he tries out different terms and he tries out different approaches to the stanza um, and, and comes ultimately to, to, what, to what he published. So uh, if that's interesting to you, that's chapter three of the book and you can take a closer look to see how his thinking and writing develops as he composes that passage. Okay, so to conclude, um, the conclusion of my book looks at some contemporary writers, Kirill Medvedev, Andrei Sintinkov, um, and, a, and a third poet who seem to question the value of this constant sort of, everybody has a camera in their pocket, right? We're always doing this performance of self-documentation. And this poem from Kirill Medvedev in 1999 really calls that into question. He sees it as a very menacing force at that, at that point, sort of the turn of the millennium. And these other poets seem to create poems about photography that reject documentation, reject self-documentation. Um, and so I conclude in the book that I'm, I, I'm hypothesizing that there's going to be a trend where poets writing on photography are going to try to reject this constant self-documentation that we see around us and try to live in the moment and sort of see the world, not through the lens of our own, not through our cameras all the time, right? But experience it um, in, a, in a new kind of mindful way. Um, but the poem I wanna conclude with is, is by the um, Ukrainian poet, Irina Shavalova, And she's doing something very different. This, so Shavalova oops, lives in Nanjing, China. She teaches there. And when the war broke out, she, like us, right, is seeing her country at war through the photographs, right, through social media. And so I think social media imagery in this new context challenges that conclusion that I make in the book that we're trying to reject that. We, we have, you know, this is the way that we experience the war from a distance. Um, and this poem is, is really about how the photographs that we see, right, we identify something that's our own within these images um, and the way that people, particularly Ukrainians in the diaspora community are experiencing what's happening. So I will read this in, in English, but you have the Ukrainian up there as well. At first glance, every bombed house in the photo looks like your own. Every child sleeping in the Metro has the face of your daughter. The news doesn't happen to us, happens to us. The woman in the photo, desperate palm covering her twisted weeping mouth I don't know this woman. I know this woman. So I'll just leave you with, with these words um, where we see this kind of common humanity through looking at the photographs, right? Recognizing some aspect of ourselves in images from, from this place um, that, is, that is dealing with, with war and, and trauma and how that reflects and sort of reverberates out through uh, the power of the, of the photographic image. And that is all. I have a few books that I recommend always at the end of this talk if you're interested in more photo poetics. Kat Reichel's Photographic Literacy, Cameras in the Hands of Russian Authors, looks at Soviet prose writers who were also photographers. It's a fantastic book. Sergei Okashin has a new book about photo montage. Um, if you want to look beyond Russian and Slavic traditions, uh, Shinking Wu's Photo Poetics, this was published last year by Columbia University Press. Chinese lyricism and modern media culture is a really beautiful book as well. So a few, a few recommendations there. And here's the discount code if you want to jot this down. 30% off the book uh, on Cornell's website with 09 Flyer. Um, and I look forward to your questions and comments on what you heard today. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions, um, both from the studio audience and online. Then I'll start. Great. Um, so this is really great um, and um, a wonderful refresher for me because it's been a while since I read the book and it's um, really fantastic. I like you bringing it up to right to today, not just because of my own bias to today, but because it really does um, touch on two questions that I think are really obvious to ask when we're reading this material, looking at this material from 100 years ago. Um, so one of them you brought up, this whole problem of 
the self documentation that we have, which is so different from what they're looking at, and Kitty and the is going addressing that. So, so part one is, you know, beyond that, is there any reflection so far about not just the fact that it's um, so common, but that it's digital, and that the whole process things you've been talking about aren't really happening, and that in a way there's a kind of um, almost equivalence to what's happening to photography, what's happening to poetry, that poetry also moves online as a set of tiny things. And the second is just from that last poem, which is truly really amazing, um, if maybe one of the things that's happening with the image is that the personal domestic image has become completely um, completely devoid of, of sentiment or content or, or, or purpose, but that we're reminded that the um, documentary, uh, that the documentary image of what's really a, a big things happening still has real value and might have might still have more potential for poetry. Um, so I'm wondering in the second part if you've seen more reflection on that, or if that's just from this particular moment, and the first part about digital. Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good question. So one of the books I had up there is um, Andrew Miller's. Poetry, photography, process. So he looks only at ekphrastic poems, and he sort of does a typography of what you can, what the different, the sort of typology of what happens when a poet describes a photograph. There are different ways to do it. And in the final chapter of his book, he takes up this problem of of the vision of um, the digital age. And so he finds uh, like there's one Polish poem that seems to look at um, like digital manipulation of images and text, but in general, he, he wasn't finding a lot. And he's looking across sort of European English language, but also other European language poetry uh, describing photographs. And, and at, at the time that he wrote this, I think it was published in 2015, he, he was concluding there really isn't much on digital photo poetics. And he was surmising perhaps it's because we haven't had enough time with it, we've had 20 and 25 years, right? Um, and perhaps there isn't an appetite. And that's what I was seeing. So I looked at two recent issues of the uh, Israeli-Russian journal, Dvayetochia. It's online. There are two issues recently devoted to writing on photography and poetry and photography. And I found a lot of engagement with analog photography, right? That was, because there's something so magical in the developing process and, and thinking about cameras and lenses and refraction and, and development. Um, and so there's almost a nostalgia for that, that older form. And so when I, when I wrote the conclusion to the book, I, was, I found these poems where there's a rejection of documentation. There's a turn away from the digital um, to either analog forms of photography or to experiencing the world differently, not just on our phones all the time. But I, I feel like this poem, in the context of the work, it has to be, right? She's seeing this just as we are. These are images on social media. These are not, nobody prints out photos and sends them right across the world. They just don't do that anymore. So they have to be digital images. And I think it really kind of undermines the argument that I'm making that there's a rejection of this. And I think it's pre precisely because of this, this crisis context, the, the war context. Um, so that's that's sort of my extended response on the on the digital analog question. I think your framing of the in the second part, like the personal and domestic becomes devoid of meaning in fit, but but document the documentary value is still important. I don't know. I I read this um Chivalva poem a little differently, I think it still very much is about the domestic, right? Looking at the photo of the child on the train, right? Or in the car, leaving the border, looking at your own child, right? Thinking about privilege, thinking about distance. It feels very um, personal and, and domestic. Um, but I think at the same time, right? We're thinking about how do we archive and how do we sort through and how do we figure out where the disinformation is and the manipulation that photographs are subject to, right? If you think about Bucha, right? What does Russia do with the Bucha images? They try to show like, well, look, it's just a, it's a deception, it's a fake. Um, and that, that has become such a, it's such a terrible concept, right? That's just infiltrated everything where some people say, you hear you get interviews with Russians and they're saying, well, this is a fake and this is a, it's all a fake, right? We're just going to give up because none of it's real. And that's so dangerous, right? How do we capture and preserve the experience of, 
of, of this war, right, in this very public way. Um, it's, such a, it's such a difficult process. Um, yet at the same time, right, the fact that we can instantly get photos from these places by just going on Twitter, it, it changes the dynamic a lot. So I don't have, I don't have a, a clear answer, but I think that there's a combination here. There's something very personal and domestic in, in some of these. And I think that's why that, that poem resonated so much with me as someone also experiencing this from, from a privileged distance and, and not having family there. But I still, you know, there's this, there's something universal about this connection, right? That this is happening to you and it's also not, it's not you, but it's still you that it's that it's happening to. These images are not of you, but they're they're still about you. They still include you. Oh yeah, so it is definitely so personal, but it's still prompted by the documentary thing, right? It's not like, oh, here's a nice photo of my kid. Um, so. Right, the, right, the whole project of right, photo aesthetics changes to like, what are we right, trying to capture? But they're still telling a story, right? I yeah. mean, the, photo, the, the photos, the best sort of journalistic photos coming out of this war, you know, best aesthetically are, are very, they're still done, right? Professional journal, photojournalists are doing things in a very particular way that, that have a, a resonance. Yeah, and there's, there's also this, this bizarre equalizing effect that you know we're familiar with not just photo everything comes across comes just on the same screen right so it's, yeah. the equivalency is really really destabilizing mm -hmm. and i think the sort of desensitizing effect of the the constant stream of social media accounts where we do sort of after a while kind of get used to and give up on <laughs> uh, and get desensitized to to the violence which is also really dangerous other questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I was really interested when you were starting to talk about Costa Knock, this idea of everything is constantly in motion. It's all a process, and the photograph is just capturing one way of capturing that process. Do you think that has any connection with kind of the advent of like how psychology is becoming much bigger and there's this different um, imagination of how we as humans are perceiving ourselves. Um. There's certainly this element of right, looking at yourself, reflecting on your past, right? Brodsky is really interested in the way that time, right? He says his main theme is like time and how it wears away, how it affects man, how it wears away at us, right? Mm -hmm. um, so mortality, but but I think, yeah, also this, this self-reflective quality, which is only accelerated right in the in the digital age. Um, with, yeah, and with Buster Knock, it's this. So the, the psychology question is interesting, too. Um, there were there were psychiatrists, um, Charcot in France, where he was using photography to study um, patients, right, sort of with suspected mental illness, trying to catalog different types. And so um there's yeah i think there is this there is a connection between the development of psychology i think and and the the development of photography in our societies but that's not something that i studied so i can't really speak to it but if you if you um write to me i can recommend a couple sources on charcoal and on on sort of the way that photography is used in in psychiatry um in in the early 20th century Any other questions? Well, if they're not, then I'd like to um, everybody join me. Thank you for this excellent talk. This was really a pleasure. And um, everybody should read this book. It's a great book. Thank you so much.